IT issues. Uh, and in the same paranoid sense, uh, I should also declare that I am a, a, the owner and um, of, a, of a niche software company that sells to PCTs, other GP system suppliers and practices. I'm Martin Thomas and I'm here on behalf of the uh, UK Computing Research Committee, which is an expert panel of the British Computer Society, of the Institution of Engineering and Technology and of the uh, Council of Professors and Heads of Computing in UK Universities. Well, again, uh, once again, welcome. Could I just start with a sort of a, just a question about the strategic direction of the uh, national programme? Uh, you've heard the answer to this question, but I'd like to put it to you three. The government is now clearly planning to introduce a central summary care record and a local detailed care record in relation to uh, the programme. Why are two systems necessary? I don't know who would like to start. Um, <coughs> well, I'm quite happy to bash. Um, uh, <coughs> I mean, I recognise your committee's recognising the, the, the sort of vault fast of the programme, because certainly it was true in 2003 when it was first announced of the national programme, it was going to be a single record accessible to anyone anywhere when necessary, under the famous three pillars. We now have a very different description of, uh, being described by Mr Granger, um, and that's a description which we welcome. Because certainly general practice believes that what we should be doing is connecting together the electronic islands that, that are out there already. So we believe in a concept of interoperability. And that therefore defines each organisation having its own detailed organisational record, which has a high degree of relevance to the users in that organisation, uh, which exchanges in, uh, snippets of information, summaries if you like, um, through standard-based messaging with other uh, systems where necessary and when necessary. Um, the, the concept of the summary care record uh, is a concept that some people believe is something which will improve patient safety. And that, that began as a concept of having a, 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 a brief extract of terribly important relevant details available uh, wherever you are externally to the, to the local detailed record. Uh, <clears throat> the concerns that we have about that is that the summary care record is actually turning out to be far from a summary care record. Uh, we are aware that there are, even, there are already, even before the evaluation of the pilots is completed, suggestions that the summary care record should also collect data from choose and book, i.e. referrals data, uh, and also possibly the electronic prescription service. So it's already looking like far more than just a summary record. Uh, if that's the case, then that raises enormous concerns about the consent arrangements because people are being consented against the summary. It also raises concerns about, uh, about uh, how you manage a multi-contributor, uh, multi-organisational record, which is something which has not been tested before. So I, I believe that there should be local detailed records at the level of organisation uh, and uh, whether you want a summary care record or not is probably a worthwhile experiment. As computing experts, we simply don't want to comment on the clinical need because it's not our expertise. What concerns us is the fact that uh, a lot, very large program is underway when the specification is, is not yet clear and keeps changing. And at best, that is a grossly inefficient way of developing uh, large IT systems and indeed of bringing about large-scale organisational change uh, and at, at worst it's it's a way that cannot succeed but you know, time will tell. On, on that issue of specification change, I, I mean you suggest Dr Kundi that uh, you know, you're unhappy obviously with the model of X number of years ago which was going to be a national spine with 60 million patient <coughs> records and it accessible from lands entered not quite to uh, John O'Groats because it stops at the uh, Scottish border, but anyway, uh, Berwick or, or beyond. Uh, it seems under those sort of circumstances uh, that's changed. Now, you're suggesting that the summary situation might be a bit difficult for you as well. I mean, I use the expression, a political compromise. May I just drop the polit politics out of this? It was a consensus that had to come about because some people and the profession included didn't like or some parts of the profession didn't like didn't like the idea of patient records being 
presumably accessible beyond the immediate institution that they live in. Is that a crude and wrong analysis of the situation? <coughs> Uh, it's a perfectly fair observation. Uh, whether it's true, um, I think I, would, I dispute. Um, I think one of the points to make is that general practitioners have enorm enormous experience of dealing with complex electronic records. Uh, despite the description that Mr Granger gave of general practice systems at the moment, they are world-beating systems. Uh, I, can, I have a system that I can go from the documents, the letters uh, on my patients, through the pathology results in a couple of mouse clicks to a graph of their, all their blood pressures over since inception. Uh, we've, we've now recently developed the technology through a project which was begun before the national program to exchange GP records wholesale from one practice to another. 600 practices in the country have that. It's almost getting on for 10%. And that exchange can occur in a matter of minutes. Um, <clears throat> if you can exchange information, share information in that fashion, that therefore must question the concept of sharing information under the program, which is to put it all into one single bucket, which may represent mirrors of information held elsewhere and control access to that bucket. And we believe that that's uh, <coughs> something which has been untested, but we also we, we suspect it's something which is probably unmanageable and potentially unsafe. Because if, you, if, if we pick up on a point which was made earlier, different doctors need different information. As, as Gillian Brownell said, I don't want to know every single potassium result from a patient of mine while they spend 10 days in the cardiac dependency unit at the local hospital. What I want to know is that they went in, when they went in, what, uh, what the diagnosis was, when they came out, and what drugs they were on. And that can be sent to me in a completely different way to my having to uh, uh, go into a, a, a single large data repository. I mean, it just strikes me... I mean, this is a general point about the programme. It's ambitious, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you go back in hundreds of years in medical history, you know, some of the things that doctors were doing at the time which made major breakthroughs were, you know, uh, people were sceptical about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people turned around and were questioning what their, even their peer groups were doing in terms of whether that was the right thing to do. And yet... You know, at the beginning of the 21st century, certainly in this country, life expectancy and everything else, well, until quite recent years of uh, young children and obesity, but life expectancy has been uh, pretty incredible in terms of the extension of it and the quality of our life as well has greatly improved because of people doing things for the first time. And, and uh, quite frankly, if people will question it on the basis, well, we don't think it will work or it might not be manageable and everything else, we may not have made the progress through the sort of uh, centuries that we have done in, in, in society in general and throughout the world. Don't you think that this sort of questioning of every little minutia or potentially every little minutia is something that uh, uh, is non-progressive? Well, I, I think... of a better expression. Uh, I, 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 I am not a Luddite. Most GPs are not Luddites. We are actually pushing for things, even now, that the, the, the programme is not delivering, the programme we would like to deliver. We have been pushing, that's why our systems are so well developed. I think sometimes the problem is that the agenda we're pushing for is a different one. Um, and that may be because of the position we inhabit in, in the NHS, which is we are the guardian of the lifelong record. I totally agree that you have to try things, but I, I, do you want to conduct your experiment on 56 million patient records, or do you want to try some pilots first? And the initial, the initial proposal was an experiment on 56 million records. And, and that uh, 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 was a view that we, did, we didn't share. OK, well, I'll, I'll just move on, because I, I wanted to, to, to ask specifically uh, Andrew Hawker. Uh, I mean, you're, uh, you argued that all clinical information should be held lo locally with only a unique patient identifier on the central system. <coughs> what would be the advantage of this approach? I think it, I would echo um, the earlier comment. You then have absolutely no doubt to whom that information belongs, who's actually managing it, accountable for it, and so on. Um, and it seems to me that we're drifting almost into a situation where you have a hybrid system, you have local and national records. It's not clear to me who actually is finally responsible for one or the other. And I'm also, at the same time, and I'd like, I hope we'll come back to this, 
um, we're being invited to give, in effect, two kinds of consent. There's one sort of consent if it goes on something called the care record, um, but there'll be some other kind of consent process for the local record. That's as it comes across to me. And both of these don't seem to me a very well thought out um, philosophy. Right. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, uh, Thomas, you wanted to say something earlier? Yes, and it, it seems to me that there are two issues that, that, that are being, being run together here. I mean, the, the overall objectives of the system seem to be trying to tackle two problems in, in parallel, and those two issues are perhaps in conflict. Uh, on the one hand, there's the question of putting in good IT to support the clinicians supporting the patients. And I think everybody is, in, in the NHS is entirely behind that, that, that where IT can, can um, improve healthcare, it, it's sensible to deploy it once you're in a position to be able to, to roll it out without disturbing things too much. There's also the issue of transforming the way that the health service operates and the way that the health service is managed and the need for information to be available in order to be able to change the management structures. And I suspect that there are a lot of stakeholders throughout the health service <coughs> who actually um, are resistant to the notion of change of management. That would be absolutely normal in any large organisation. Bringing those two things together and trying to use the IT programme as a facilitator for bringing about managerial and organisational changes that have not already been agreed is, is in my experience, never successful. I'm very tempted to refer you back to the report we did on workforce planning, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> We're just trying to get some sleep without the thought of it at the moment. Uh, uh, or is it really saying that the summary care record that we're getting is basically because the government have admitted it can't produce what it wanted to do in terms of the national electronic record and, and that in, in a sense that this is just the, the fail to do that so this is just this compromise that, that I talked about earlier. I, I was listening very very carefully to the answers you got when you were asking your earlier witnesses a, about that and, and it seemed to me that they contained a, a lot of um, contradictions and um, lack of clarity about what they really were trying to do and the the notion that you could introduce a summary care record and then use it as the local care record because it had the flexibility to enable local care groups to upload whatever information they wanted to and could agree to to actually share amongst themselves that that looks to me like a, a, a specification creep that is, is highly likely to undermine the security policies that are being put in place because now you're, you're starting to handle data where at the time you designed the security policies you, you didn't necessarily know that that data was going to be available in that record. So whilst I, I sympathise greatly with the, the motivations of Dr Granger and his team and their enthusiasm for using modern technology and, and I sympathise very strongly with the difficulties they've got in, in actually working out exactly what they can do and on what timescales and what's practical. To do it in the context of a national programme with declared goals and declared rollout targets and declared implementations in hospitals across the country, and, and then actually to run a programme which is exploratory in nature, is... is just a backward way of running a, a very large project, it seems to me. And I, I, I imagine Dr. Granger got trapped into it by, by the politics of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not accusing him of incompetence at all. I'm, I'm merely saying that, having seen what's happening, we, we, we need to back off and say, no, let's, let's plan this so that, that we can maximise the progress we can make and minimise the financial and timescale risks and and contingent damage that we might do to the health service in the process. How do you get large projects if you don't do it like this? Oh, e every successful large project has grown out of a successful small project. Could I ask Thomas? Dr. Thomas, just a very quick question. I've seen quite a few computer projects over the last sort of 10, 15 years in local authority and in universities and in government and almost everyone suffers from this specification creep that you're talking about as people get to know about a project 
They want to bolt new things in. Now, it happens, in my experience, in every computer project, whether it's large or small. And the clever thing to do is to manage this and stop this at the right point. Is that nonsense, or is there some truth in what I've just um, said? There, there are two sources of, of specification change. Um, one is uh, genuine specification change, where people discover um, new requirements, or, the, or while the, yeah. the project is actually being developed, the world changes around them, and they have to, have to change it. And the other are specification changes that occur simply because you didn't investigate the specification well enough at the beginning, and therefore you discover um, holes in your own understanding of what the, the situation always was and always would have been. Well, what I put into you is that nearly always happens. Both it nearly always things, happens nearly because, always. because the, the current style for developing computing projects is, is, is simply broken. If, if you're building a large building, um, what you, uh, which, which can very often be a, 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 um, uh, an organisational change process as well, what you do is you bring in an architect and the architect works with you to really understand your requirements. They formalise those requirements, they come up with a high level design, in the process they uncover all, all sorts of conflicts, contradictions, things that you hadn't heard of. They can bring to bear their own experience in those sorts of buildings, help you to really understand your requirements. Then they move around to your side of the table and actually put out a contract to procure the building that has been designed. We don't do that at the moment in IT systems. We put out a contract to procure on the basis of the ill-founded, contradictory specifications with holes in. And, and then, so surprisingly, what, it goes wrong. So of your criticisms are not just of this project, it's of nearly all It's of, of nearly all projects, but yeah. um, you know, this, is, this is a project <coughs> where perhaps we've got a chance of, of saying, just hold your horses. We, we can get to where you want to get to faster, cheaper, and at lower risk if we simply reassess um, what you're doing and, and can get rid of, of some of the baggage of having to live up to promises made by, the, by people in the past. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Sandra. Uh, a question for Dr. Thomas. Um, your submission argued that the electronic record system should be introduced as a series of small systems um, rather than, um, sorry, that, we, that can be built up into a national system rather than what's, what's happening. The government seems to be doing the complete opposite of what you're advocating in your submission. Yes, I'm re really what I'm, what I'm saying is, is what I said earlier, that, that successful large systems grow out of successful small systems. Now, I, I don't want to really propose technical solutions because I don't believe that the specification, the requirements, are really very well understood yet. And so my instinct would be to do lots of prototyping and work with the, the clinicians in the front line to really find out what works for them, what they're happy with, what works with their patients, <coughs> and then to stand back and decide what you actually want to do on a national basis. Talking to a group of people who now understand the power of the technology better because they've worked with you on the prototypes and where you've managed to evolve specifications that have, have really cl come out of the real experience of the, of the clinicians who will need to use them. I, I may have misunderstood. I, I uh, got the impression that you were um, talking about different systems joining together potentially, which would have um, surely problems is, if they didn't interact with each other. It is generally a better architecture for a large system to um, have a, a lot of individual components which can <coughs> then fail independently, because fail they will, without actually causing widespread disruption. Uh, and so if you can build large systems out of small systems which intercommunicate in a standard way, that gives you a much more resilient architecture. And one of our concerns is that there doesn't appear to be an overall dependability case for the national programme. Sorry, a dependability uh, there, there doesn't appear to be a, a structured argument that says, here are the goals for, um, you know, the quantified goals for the availability of the system, for the reliability of the overall system, for the accuracy of the data, for the number of security breaches that are tolerable, those sort of issues. And here is a structured argument based on sound evidence that the systems we are building will actually deliver 
those quantified dependability objectives. We, we actually, um, a, a group of us asked Dr. Granger whether such a case was being prepared, and he said he did not have the information to do that because it was actually proprietary to his suppliers, and therefore his, his team, by implication, wasn't in a position to assess the dependability of what they were buying. Uh, I, was, I was taken aback. So there are no examples in the past of the sort of approach you're advocating failing? Oh, uh, it would be uh, an appalling thing to do to claim there are no examples of, of any kind of, of computing system architecture failing. I think, uh, I think the computing profession has managed to fail in uh, almost every conceivable way <laughs> so far, and no doubt will continue to do so. But you know, that, that's true of all new engineering disciplines, and you, you learn from your failures. Could I just ask you a quick question, Dr. Thomas? Uh, wanting everything at the beginning of the journey, as it were, uh, is the ideal world for anybody who was involved in engineering. I'm a lapsed engineer, given I've been in politics for a long time now. Uh, but what was described this morning, and what I picked up now and again, was issues that have been effectively add-ons to this system, like electronic imaging transfer, which I have talked to some uh, 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 clinicians who feel <coughs> it's just a wonderful thing to happen. Now, with the model set out and written down large at the outset, something like that, presumably, would have potentially been blocked off and said, well, sorry, we can't do it because it's not, in this, it's not what we've set out to do. So would this very descriptive, which is very reassuring from an engineering point of view, that this is the project that you're going to deliver over time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so from an engineer's point of view, uh, would it limit the ability to be able to do things like add-ons that, that we've heard about this morning? Clearly, you're, you're not a lapsed engineer. Once an engineer, or you're always an engineer. Well, the, uh, the, the engineering understanding will never leave you. It's like riding a bus. So I ended up here, but anyway, <laughs> by the by. But, uh, um, yes, no, I, I, I mean... I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you should have come up with a specification um, for all the things that you wanted to do that was completely locked down and that you weren't prepared to change. Yes. Um, and I, I just wonder if... You, you know, if it was an add-on in view, it wasn't actually thought about when, 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 when people sat around in the room and, and developed this, that, that, you know, a system that was rigid would block it off. I mean, it no, I, I think the programme could quite reasonably have said that there are a lot of point solutions in healthcare. Yeah. We're introducing specific systems to support specific activities yeah. that are actually independent and don't need to be highly connected into other parts of, of the system or the overall architecture would be a very powerful thing to do. So let's have a budget for doing that because they will come up. And I, one of my concerns about the way that the program is going is, is that it is in danger of locking itself out of the advances that will be made in, in the availability of healthcare systems around the world. In, in setting out to be a leader and to develop standards which it hopes will be adopted elsewhere, there's a danger of, of investing a very large amount in, in a, a, an architecture, in software and so on, which, which rapidly becomes obsolete in, in that other people have come up with better solutions and you can't easily swap them in because you've built something that's too highly integrated. May I comment on this? Um, I think that one of the, th the significant failings of the program was that they didn't consult with the user base when, whilst they are um, developing their specification. And a good example of that is that whilst Mr. Mr. Granger in his first year was dealing with the LSP contracts, we were negotiating our new GP contract. And we signed that off in uh, April 2003 this, the contracts for the LSPs were signed off in November 2003, and it wasn't until after that that someone said to him, well, did you not know there are things in our contract that you've got to deliver, such as the add-ons that he was talking about, QMAS, uh, GP to GP, and he did not know about those. And the LSPs were going around um, uh, giving presentations to GPs saying, this is a system we're going to give you, fun something fantastic. It'll give you pathology results. And the GPs were saying, well, we've had that for five years. Um, the, the problem with the with, the, with uh, I, I see is that, uh, and the PACS is another good example, 
Many of the PAC systems being installed now are the PAC systems that were on order books in 2001, 2 and before, that were put on hold because a new program came along. They are, they are essentially the same systems, they'll be the sort of the 8th version, but they're basically the same product, but being under, uh, under a different procurement mechanism. And what happened was the program came along, said we're going to do this, and Trust said, well, we actually, we actually need a PAC system, so that was then brought in. The failure was not adequately, adequately understanding the market that Mr. Granger was procuring for. He went out and procured under, uh, under, under his ex experience of procuring where he's procured before, but he did not put enough time into consulting with the users what it was they needed to deliver the program. And if that had been done, we would have had a much more incremental building on what you've already got approach, which I think would have been more successful. David, do you? Listen to you three gentlemen. I think it's a great shame that the three previous witnesses cleared off as soon as you started, because I'd have liked to have seen the six of you together, a bit of creative attention, and got the inquiry off to a bit of a bang. I mean, uh, all they're going to have to do is read about what, what you've said, but... Um, can't be helped. Where is your practice, Dr. Cullen? Uh, I'm in South Wimbledon Atlanta. Village. In Wimbledon Village? Yeah, a, very, a very informed and affluent population. It sure <laughs> is. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. Rather nice. Uh, Dr. Cundy, is it uh, a good thing that general practitioners will be offered a choice of suppliers for their electronic record system? And does the decision to offer choice represent a change of um, direction by connecting for health, um, and will it mean a less centralising approach to these issues? Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's not a good thing because it's illustrating the, the precise point I was making earlier. Uh, our, new, our new contract specified that GPs would have a choice of systems from a list of accredited systems. That was negotiated between 2002, signed off in 2003. In November 2003, Mr. Granger signed contracts with the LSPs that did not have GP, GP choice in them. It has taken us three years to get to the state where we are now, where we are about to let the contracts with the GP suppliers that will give us what should have been delivered in our new contract of 2003. So from that point of view, it's a very good thing because it's what the, the government is, um, is delivering on what it committed to three years ago. But from the point of view of is it a good thing as a result of the programme. No, it's not. It's been held back three years by the programme. And if they had cons properly consulted the marketplace, it, we would not be three years late with it. Is it a good thing that we have lots of different systems to choose from? Uh, yes, and we've been through this iteration before. I've been in IT now for well, too, far too many years, chairman of this committee for 11 years. And I've seen this thing cycle. Prior to the program, we had a thing called RFA, Requirements for Accreditation, which was an attempt to uh, get systems to work together to common standards. That largely failed because the procurement side of it wasn't, uh, wasn't aggressive enough, didn't have enough teeth. And that resulted in a marketplace where there were about 31 different systems that you could purchase from. Um, Mr. Granger's intention was to just throw all those away and have just effectively two or three systems for everyone. That's now rolled back, and we now have a situation where yesterday we were evaluating applications from nine different systems, which is probably a healthy and vibrant market. It means we'll have suppliers who will have to be competing in a properly funded market on a level playing field, uh, simply on the basis of user functionality. And that is, my, in my opinion, an ideal position to get to. But it's a position which we negotiated in our new contract it was not delivered to us by the programme. Well, it obviously doesn't reflect very well at all on the gentleman responsible for this, and it's a very poor example of joined-up government, really. Is there um, a, a financial cost in all this in terms of the delay and the um, well, I would less like than satisfactory approach? My only comment is that, that we offered to um, uh, meet Mr Granger very early on after he was appointed in early 2003 mm -hmm. so that we could explain to him that we had, uh, this is addressing another point he made earlier, general practice views on what GPs want for IT are actually very clear cut. There's one committee that it has representatives of the Royal College, GPC which is effectively the union and people who use systems. 
we have a very clear established structure for defining what we want, which is how we, enab we were able to very clearly uh, place it in our new contract. If he had come to us and said, what is it you want, then we would have given him a very clear picture, and it may be that the LSP situation would have been different. But it may also be that he was told under political direction to not deliver it. I mean, I don't know. You, one, one can become very, very interesting. And how, how I wish he were here now to uh, respond to those points. Uh, finally, Dr. Cundy and Dr. Thomas, if general practitioners are to have a choice of supply, shouldn't hospitals and other care providers also have a choice? I'm sorry you're being left out of this, this hall, but you've got <coughs> more fish to fry later. Uh, yes. Yes, I would, I would think that's almost certainly the best solution. Yeah. Well, it, it leads me into a, a question in relation to that. Uh, I looked at uh, use of IT in my local health economy in the mid-90s. Uh, and I went to my local hospital, which now is starred by uh, Jerry Robinson uh, on BBC television, Rotherham Hospital. And they just installed a wonderful pass system. And I actually watched a nurse fill in the discharge uh, electronically, the discharge, I've got a keyboard out for a patient that was going to be discharged from that ward on that day. And I said, that's wonderful. I said, how long will this be before it gets to this uh, her GP? And I was told that actually the letters and the discharge uh, uh, things are printed off at night on the night shift when the hospital's quiet and hopefully patients are sleeping and uh, things are a bit quieter and sent out to the general practitioner by mail. And I said, well, what about if somebody wanted some immediate help in the community, like a nurse to call round the day that they get back at home? Oh, well, we phoned the local GP up and tell them, or tell the district nurses up, that, that this individual might need that type of help. Now, that was choice inside the National Health Service in the mid-1990s, that my hospital system didn't uh, did have the ability to talk electronically, to send that discharge papers through to the local GP surgery that was involved in the care of that patient once you'd left rather than hospital premises. Uh, now, people have a responsibility and, and ministers and others have a responsibility to both to patients in those circumstances and to taxpayers. That choice is coherent in as much as we are able to have systems and IT in the National Health Service that does have the ability to do pretty fundamental things like talk to one another and assist patient care. Would you dispute that? No, I wouldn't. And um, <clears throat> I became chairman of my committee in 1995. In July of 1995, I, I coined the phrase at a British Computing Society primary healthcare group, the, the electronic islands of, of the NHS. And the, the concept of interoperability is precisely what you're talking about. Yes. You want the electronic island of the hospital to be able to communicate a meaningful message about a patient to the electronic island that's relevant, i.e. the general practice, but it could be the chiropody service or the speech therapist. Uh, and that's what, precisely what interoperability is about. And I believe that's precisely what you're seeing, the programme now moving towards. It's a pity that... Moving towards. Yes, well, that, that's, that's, that's the message I, That's the message that I heard from...